So I'll give it a minute for the attendee numbers to go up. Yeah, I'll just. Um, oh, wait, I was going to. Love your background, by the way, Jeff. Is it like a, a tapestry? It's this preposterous tapestry that we found at a like antique store. I like it. It's really nice. <laughs> I'm sort of convinced it has lots of like drugs from the 70s in it still, to be honest. It looks a little, a little decadent and scary. Yeah. We vacuumed, don't worry. Hi guys, we're starting to get some attendees in. We'll just give it another minute or so before we start. I know um, the having children session and apathy sessions were on directly before this. So I think a few people were just leaving the having children session. I feel like I need to do something entertaining. I mean, you can sing while we're waiting, it's up to you. <laughs> no, you do not want me to entertain you with singing. Not my strong suit. I can bring a cute dog. That's always good for cheap oh, points, right? Dog would be adorable. Yeah, Argos, come here, buddy. I need. Oh, yeah, I need some. Yeah, quite a well. A few more people are uh, joining now. So hi guys, while we wait, just give it another minute. Jeff's just going to show off his adorable doggy while we're waiting. What's his name? Argos. Argos. Argos, do you want to give the presentation, buddy? Hey, up here. Oh, who's that? Oh, you actually smell pretty bad. Oh, yeah, that breath is really unappealing. Okay. Now I've got him riled. <laughs> cool. I think the attendee numbers are starting to level out a bit, but we'll probably still have a few more people join after the previous sessions are just finishing. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you everybody for joining our final session of the day. And we're really pleased to have the wonderful Jeff Carroll sharing his HD journey with you all. Um, and if you haven't heard the story, um, his story before you're in, you're in for a treat. Um, and we're very grateful to have your time Jeff today because I know you've already done a session earlier with, with Ed. Um, Jeff's um, always been happy to attend HDO's events around the world and I uh, really appreciate everything he does for the community. So this session will be a 30-minute uh, session and there'll be questions um, at the end or, or whenever Jeff, uh, yeah, whenever Jeff's able to answer them. Um, so if you can put them in the Q&A box and I'll keep an eye out for them as well. Um, but yeah, Jeff is a pro at Zoom, so he probably doesn't need me. <laughs> so I'll hand over to Jeff. Thanks, Anne. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I feel really weird talking about myself for 30 minutes, um, but nevertheless, here we are. And I also got my dog really excited about what's happening on my computer, and so now he's barking. So I apologize ahead of time if, if there's a sharp yipping bark right before I murder my dog. Um, so Matt asked me to come and give a chat just about my my sort of story, um, my, my sort of history with the HD field. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and um, hopefully it's interesting or useful or less boring than sitting in your house watching Netflix again, as we're all sick of doing by now. Um, and I'm gonna try to look at the Q and A and the chat. Um, I teach a lot on Zoom right now, so I'm pretty used to this. Um, so um, feel free to ask questions. I don't think you guys are allowed to talk. <laughs> you guys can't talk, you have to ask by text. Um, so always good to start with an embarrassing picture of yourself. Um, this is, uh, this is, I guess, where the story starts. Uh, this is me when I was, I don't know, well, let's just say dorky, but like 11, 12 maybe. Um, fabulous 80s tight rolled pants, great little short sleeve Target shirt, beautiful glasses. Actually, these glasses are hip again. So um, I think I'm, that's how you know you're old. But um, so it was around this age when um, my um, maternal grandmother started becoming sick from Huntington's disease. Um, it, it, 
it, it should have kind of been obvious to our family what, what that meant and sort of like what that was going to mean for the rest of us. But um, we didn't we didn't really talk about it. So like a lot of you probably, you know, my family didn't have a very um, uh, healthy or proactive way of talking about anything really, but talking about Huntington's in particular. And so despite the fact that around this time my grandma was getting sick, um, we never really talked about it. I think I might have heard the word Huntington's disease like a couple times maybe. Um, you know, in that sort of like shameful, quiet way that parents talk about stuff that they don't want the kids to know about. And so I would, it maybe it was like deep down in my memory bank somewhere, but definitely nobody told me what that meant or would have meant. And no one, no one told us, um, you know, the, the family, like what it would mean uh, for my mom and then for her kids. So um, it's a, a, we're better looking as you go uh, forward in time. So this is us a little bit later. So there's six kids in my family. So um of course um you can all do the math now um hey Megan that's a little loud um uh with six kids my mom was sort of um uh ultimately at risk of of half of us having HD um and as it turned out um you know the odds were actually worse than that unfortunately um all the kids in my family have been tested now and and four of us uh, have HD mutation and so in the absence of um effective treatments being developed will develop the disease um, so as we got older, you know, we got kind of away from our normal family stuff. My grandmother was at this point still like sick and still in a nursing home in a bed, but, um, kind of sadly, she like, I think at some point she stopped being able to communicate very well. And my, my mom, my mom would keep, would still go maybe like on holidays and stuff. My grandma lived in a nursing home for a really long time in a, in a really, really sad state. Um, and uh, eventually my mom visited her, but just stopped talking about her. And so it's in that weird, sad way that families have, you know, we kind of stopped, stopped talking about my grandma. And like, it's really weird to say that now, but I'm sure a lot of families out there know what I'm talking about. You know, we kind of at this stage of our lives went on with our lives and tried to do our own thing. And um, I, uh, <laughs> I joined the army. Um, so it's a long story, but it involves um, poor decisions and, uh, the strong desire to get away from where I was. Um, so this is me in 1996 joining the army, super, super skinny me. I, um, I always joke about this picture that like, uh, I learned when I went to this, this is at the, at the entry station where they like let you join, sign your contract and join the army. I learned that they have a minimum body fat percentage to join the US army, which is like 5%. And I had like 5.2% body fat. And it's not because I was like awesome. It's because I had only ate Funyuns and like lattes. Um, so anyway, join the army, classic American story, get away from home. Um, and it turned out to be good for me. So I actually put on some weight and like got some discipline and did that whole thing. And, um, things are going pretty well. And then the army, uh, in the way that only the U S army can really, really screw you. Um, the army was like, you know, you join the army to get away from home. So like, where would we send him that would make his life horrible? We'll send him back home. And so the, the army sent me to Fort Lewis, Washington, which is 20 minutes from my house, which is like the last place in the world I wanted to be. U.S. military is everywhere, right? It's like an imperial power. It could be in Australia. We could have been anywhere. They sent me 20 minutes from home. Um, and so I, 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 I started like escaping and running away. Um, and on the weekends when I was at Fort Lewis and I uh, went up to Vancouver, uh, this nearby mythical land in Canada, which actually I'd never been to before. You can get pretty far in America, not knowing that Canada's there, but I did the classic thing and, and, and met a Canadian girlfriend, which is sort of, you know, uh, everybody's excuse for the girlfriend that doesn't actually exist, but mine actually did. So um, this is Megan, uh, who I met uh, when I started um, running off to Vancouver. I met her in Vancouver. We started dating uh, when I was at Fort Lewis. And then, um, you know, along that same time, um, my mom uh, had started to um, uh, have some symptoms. And so, Megan and I, uh, I got stationed in Germany. Uh, Megan came uh, to visit me and we decided it'd be funny if we got married. So we like ran off and eloped in Europe, didn't really tell anyone. Uh, uh, and we're just kind of enjoying life, like touring around Europe and having fun and, 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 and chilling and, and things at home were not going so well. So my mom, so this is my mom, Cindy, around that time, kind of before she got really sick. Um, it's my mom, Cindy, me, I can tell just by the bricks that were at church because it was my like least favorite place on earth. And so I got, I get the heebie jeebies just looking at that wall, but, um, that's us at church. Um, so, you know, around this time, like my mom started getting, um, sick, um, and things were really chaotic. And as, as you all know, and, um, so I was living at Fort Lewis and dating this girl in Canada. And then, um, I got orders to go to Germany 
Um, and, you know, um, from there, we got sent uh, off to Kosovo. So in 1999, I got sent uh, as part of the first uh, uh, Kosovo peacekeeping force. Um, I got sent uh, to go do a peacekeeping mission. And it was it was there that I really just like had time to sit and think, you know, it'd been so chaotic and things have been crazy with traveling and knowing about my mom and worrying about what that meant for everybody that, you know, I basically sat down on the internet and I was like, okay, I'm going to like learn everything there is to learn about Huntington's. This is kind of like the proto internet. This is like 1999 internet, right? So I'm not like Googling things. I'm like on Yahoo trying to figure out what is Huntington's disease. Um, and got some really like vague sense that it was really t terrible and things were not great. Um, but just got really frustrated with not being able to understand uh, what was happening. And around then, um, I uh, after my tour in Kosovo and after a few more months in Germany, I, I wrapped up my army career um, and moved back to Vancouver where Megan was from. And this is why I moved back to Vancouver because it looks like this. Actually, this is very close to the view from their condo where um, Megan and I lived. Um, so I moved back to Vancouver. Um, you know, out of the army, but kind of like anxious to, to get back to real life, um, but still really worried about Huntington's. I, I always knew that I wanted to go back to college. So um, my plan, um, and I was lucky enough to get accepted at University of British Columbia, which is here, which is this gorgeous school um, out in uh, Point Grey in Vancouver, uh, in, um, spent, uh, actually they admitted me as a philosophy major, which is a whole other story, but I basically like cheated my way into biology classes um, by just being really annoying, which I got good at in the army. but. Um, I took uh, some biology classes just to try to figure out, you know, like what's a gene, what's DNA, what's a CAG repeat, all that kind of stuff. And um, actually found it like super fascinating and I and much more than I thought. And I, I, I had kind of thought like, I'll go take a class or two, figure out this Huntington stuff and then like go get a real job, like go to law school or something. But I just kept going. Um, so, um, and uh, just, just got really fascinated. In the second year of my undergrad, um, I went through predictive testing for HD. I knew as soon as I heard about my mom, I, I had said I was going to do it. Like a lot of people, it like took me a while. Um, so I had to kind of kind of get my crap together, like emotionally and also practically. Um, and in the second year of my undergrad, um, went through predictive testing at the University of British Columbia and learned that, um, like my mom, I had the mutation for HD. Um, and like I said, subsequently, you know, multiple of my siblings have gotten the same awful news. So. Um, you know, it's a story. I don't have to tell this crowd. You guys know how that is. But um, uh, so it's really devastating. And and while I when I got the news, I, I sort of thought, well, what am I going to do? You know, like it's now my life's going to be short and I can't do this and I can't do that. Um, and I sort of thought, like, well, why not? I might as well just go for it. And, you know, I'm really enjoying lab research. Um, and so I kind of in, <laughs> rebelled, I guess, by enrolling in a Ph.D., Super lucky that um, UBC has this incredible HD, you know, center of the universe kind of. Thanks a lot to the efforts of Michael Hayden and his colleagues that have that have been there for ages, and both clinically and and in research terms, um, building up amazing expertise in HD. So um, this is actually probably not me pipetting because um, I was taking the picture, but um, you know, just learned lots of science, learned how to work with mouse models, which is still my day job, um, and really just found that I just love science, and I think. You know, one of the one of the things for me um, was it was like it took something horrible like HD to I, I never would have taken a science class, but actually it's super fascinating and amazing. So if there's any young people listening and they're like, "What do I want to do?" or "What can I do with my life?" like having a career in actually in science is actually a possibility. And and you know, coming from where I came from, nobody ever told me that. I didn't grow up around scientists or academics. I didn't know that like you could do science for a job and get paid for it. Um, and you can, and it's amazing, and it's a cool job. So. If you're young and you're motivated and you're passionate about this stuff, um, don't don't think that it's not an option because um, because it, it definitely is. Even even me can make a go of it. So it was uh, it was there uh, in Vancouver um, where uh, we actually it was kind of an amazing confluence of things because the World Congress on Huntington's Disease happened to be in Vancouver during my PhD. Um, and it, it's an, it used to be a really amazing meeting. It's not happening anymore, which is sad, but um, it, was a, it was a cool meeting because it had clinicians and researchers for HD, but also HD families at the same meeting, which didn't really happen anywhere else. But it was really hard because like the sessions were sort of parallel and people didn't really talk to each other. And so Charles Sabine, um, good friend and um, HD colleague and, and former NBC News reporter, um, got tasked to try to have like a nightly news session where they would explain the, you know, the science to the families and the family stuff to the scientists. And he roped uh, me uh, and Ed Wild into this. And that gave Ed the excuse to, you know, Photoshop embarrassing pictures of me as a sexy barista and put it in front of like hundreds of people. But 
if you know Ed, that's just sort of standard. I, I was shocked, but I've just come to expect it. Um, but this was great fun. And I think the, the crowd really liked it. And it kind of led to us thinking a lot about the fact that the HD community has all this passion for um, wanting to know what's happening with research and, and they're motivated to understand it. Um, but they just, no one was taking the time to explain it to them. So, um, you know, I went home and I went to a couple more meetings and I had some thinking and I, I sent Ed this like typical Jeff, like long rambly email about basically like, hey, maybe we should do something about this, not just at the meetings, but maybe we should like do something to try to have better scientific outreach for HD families, um, you know, all day, every day and not just, um, not just in the, when they're, when they're coming to a conference. And so I asked Ed, you know, if we could get somebody to help with the technology and whatever, do you think that we could set up something online to try to, to reach out to people? And I have to say, it's one of the one of the amazing evolutions of the HD field is I think all of us used to feel so like alone, you know, like because we'd be the only person in our town that had Huntington's disease um, or the only family that we'd ever heard of, you know. And uh, one of the amazing things about the Internet is it's allowed um, things like HDO to, to, to form that can link this kind of you know, important but rare and distributed community of people, right, that are scattered around the world. But um, once the internet came around and was everywhere, now we can all connect. And it's an incredible way for us to do that. So it's been great fun with Ed. This is the the shortest email Ed ever sends. He just never stops talking. But um, in response to my long lengthy email about, do you want to do this? He said, yes, E, <laughs> P.S., <laughs> more to follow. Um, and that led to us, um, you know, starting HD Buzz, um, which uh, we've been doing, we just realized since 2010, and it's 2021, um, which has been a really great opportunity for us to try to communicate uh, research news to patients and families. Um, you know, it's it's been a lot of work, and it's sometimes kind of a hassle to deal with, but um, the feedback that we get from everybody um, really keeps us motivated to keep doing it. Um, it's great fun in normal times to be able to actually go to conferences and like talk to people and have Q&A sessions. Um, this is this is a great uh, adaptation by HDO. Obviously, it's better when we can all get together in person. But, um, you know, even opportunities like this uh, let us connect. Um, and Buzz will will keep on going as long as it needs to. I should have put pictures in, but we're really excited with HD Buzz now. Um, so this year, we've we've been lucky enough to bring in some more editors. So Ed and I are not as young and, you know, exciting as we used to be. Um, and so we've been uh, aware that we need to have some some kind of fresh help with Buzz, um, keeping fresh perspectives and different perspectives than just ours. Um, and so this year we've been really lucky to hire on three new part-time uh, editors. So we're not going anywhere, Ed and I will still be involved, but um, we now have doctors Rachel Harding, Sarah Hernandez and Leora Fox um, help, taking on editorial roles at Buzz. Um, and having five of us rather than two of us uh, really is going to help us, you know, grow buzz and, and keep it going. And we hope that'll be useful for you guys. Um, so, um, so that was um, <laughs> that was a heck of a consequence of the World Congress happening to be in Vancouver and Ed and I doing a fun thing that's going on 11 years later. Um, I can't remember why I had this photo in here. This is our this was our Facebook banner for a little while, and it says HD Buzz versus Science. And Ed looks like a televangelist, uh, and I look scandalized. So that's actually a pretty accurate picture. Um, you know, but while while all that stuff was you know exciting stuff was happening, you know HD is still horrible, um, and uh, it's not. Um, it's it's exciting and fun to like do research and talk about it and engage with the community. It's all really amazing, but it's all happening because of this like fundamentally like really awful thing that's happening that that, that we're all fighting against, you know. And this is uh, my brother Ben. Actually, he graduated from Western Washington University, where I uh, now have a faculty member, weirdly randomly. Um, but this is Ben standing with my mom, and and um, you know at this point. Um, she was at the stage where, you know, she would try really hard to kind of like hold still for photos, but like she couldn't because, you know, she had Korea and she was moving. And so like, you know, for every one picture that came out okay, there was a bunch of pictures where she sort of couldn't hold still. And so, you know, it's, it's just to remind me that like, um, as exciting as science is, you know, and as, as, as cool as the, the state of the research world is right now, and it really is, um, it's 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 motivating because it's horrible and the thing that we're working against is is really awful um the other thing um you know that i always want to remember to say is that like just because we don't yet have a drug for hd um doesn't mean we can't do anything you know and and I, i've heard a lot of people say like when it comes to genetic testing like oh well i can't you know if there's no treatment right now 
testing won't do anything for me. And I'm, I'm not going to try to convince anyone to get tested if they don't want to get tested, they shouldn't. But, you know, for me, getting tested was really useful. It kind of helped me organize my life. It helped me make plans uh, or, you know, fall into them as the case may be. Um, and it also helped us, my wife and I, pursue pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or genetic screening technology used to have kids that are essentially, you know, at no risk of having HD. Um, and, you know, so these two kiddos not having to worry about what we had to worry about was a, was a huge payoff. Um, and of course, again, you know, there's ways of doing PGD without getting genetic tested, but it's, it's simplified by, by the genetic test. And so for me, I always think about, you know, there really was a, a big payoff um, just for getting tested, even, um, even in the absence of, of, of treatments today. Um, and so, you know, I think PGD, um, you know, any kind of IVF is, is tough as, as probably a lot of people know, but PGD is a particularly tough, you know, it's really hard and you're going through all the stages and, and X number of embryos are, are affected by HD and another number are not viable. And it's, it's a really like long, scary, difficult, emotional process. Um, but, you know, I think if anyone's wondering or, or thinking about it, like uh, I'll tell you right now, like, I mean, my kids are 14 now and it's, um, it doesn't really matter what I do with HD, like doing that, having them through PGD was the best thing that I ever did. And like, I don't, I don't ever even question that. So um, if you have family members that are on the fence about it or haven't heard about it or might be able to profit from it, you know, young, young people thinking about having kids, um, you know, yes, I'm hopeful about treatments, but if I was to start over again today, even knowing everything I know about HD science now, if, if you were to ask me like, well, today in 2021, we're so much closer to effective treatments, hopefully it's expensive, it's still worth it. Um, and until we have an absolute cure for HD, I think you know every HD family certainly won't, won't have the resources uh, to do it, but I, I think everyone who can, um, even if it's hard, even if it's a stretch, um, should, should consider it. Um, so sorry, I'll stop ranting about that, but I feel strongly about it. So my mom um, continued to, you know, worsen um, at this point. So my mom, when the kids were this born and about this age, actually the, the funny thing about this picture, because you can get a little bit of funny right now, is the kids are actually on like a little tiny inflated pool on like a 29th floor balcony. <laughs> so there's, there's, a, there's a wall, don't worry, but there's like a very precipitous 29 story drop down there. Um, so we're really good parents. That's where we used to put them out when we lived downtown when I was finishing up my PhD. Um, so it's always this like cute, cuddly picture. And then when I look at it, I always remember that there's like a huge drop behind them. It's probably some kind of like a allegory for parenting. I don't know. Anyway, um, so uh, do PGD and, uh, you know, the cause goes on. So um, right around when they were that age, my mom got a lot worse. She, like a lot of people with HD, she didn't, she didn't really get sick at the end from HD. She got sick from something else. She had a, um, a hospital acquired infection and then she got like taken out of her assisted living home and put in kind of like a long-term chronic bed. And it was just like a really ugly situation with her, with her living situation. And her, her HD symptoms just got incredibly worse, incredibly fast. And so, you know, she was really sick, but she was pretty functional. And then um, within six months, just after our kids had been born, um, she died. Um, and this actually, this, I always show this picture when I talk about this because I took this, she died at like one in the morning or something and I, I couldn't go back to sleep. So I was driving around the island where she, um, where her nursing home was and, and took this picture like as the sun was rising at like four in the morning. So just a reminder that like um, science is exciting. I'm motivated, I'm excited about the science, um, but we're all here because we're, we're fighting against something that's, that's really bad uh, and uh, we're all on the same team. And uh, I don't know what else to say. Oh, I'll get off the sad picture. Oh, so uh, I'm speaking to you. Actually, I'm not at work right now. I'm at home with this fabulous rug, but um, my my lab that works on Huntington's all day, every day. Oh, I don't know how to use uh, Zoom is up here. So this is my university up here on the hill overlooking the San Juan Islands and the ocean um, and uh, my office and, and little HD lab are up there. So, um, you know, career wise and all that stuff, uh, things worked out and lots of smart people working on HD and uh, now I'll shut up. So I think uh, I have just a couple minutes left if people have questions or if they want to ask me about HD stuff or science stuff or whatever, I think I have six minutes of uh, questions that I can take. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks. 
Jeff. So we don't have any questions so far yet, but we have a few few comments. And um, actually, I've heard this a lot from so many people um, about being in Vancouver for that um, that first meeting. And I think that's uh, how Matt and BJ met as well. So I think um, that that meeting has got <laughs> great partnerships were formed at that meeting. <laughs> it's it goes to show you the power of community, you know. Michael Hayden and Blair Levitt, the organizers in Vancouver, did such a good job. And they're so connected with both the patient community, like deeply connected with the patient community and also the research community. And it's also like it was in a beautiful spot and there was these great events and dinners and stuff. And so it's just like it's it's good and smart to bring caring people in a community together and let them kick off ideas and things like yo and buzz and everything else can come out of it. So I think um you know, until the fight is done, I think we need to keep throwing events like that once we can again. No, definitely. Um, Cause I've only been in the community for, for a couple of years now, but I guess I was speaking to Matt and I don't think um, they hold the World Congress anymore. And I guess it tends to be more association run than a worldwide thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's it's a little bit too bad because um, because it was a unique opportunity for 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 patients, even if they don't go to the sessions to understand all the science and the scientist sessions. Like at least if they can kind of see a poster session and walk past and see a bunch of excited scientists, it's just kind of sets up um, you know casual chances for people to interact with scientists and physicians, and I think that's really good for for people in the community. Maybe we'll start it again after all this is over. <laughs> I think we all well deserve it. Deserve a big reunion after after lockdown. Um, if you've got any questions, guys, please type them in the Q and A. Um, oh, PGD one. Grant. Someone saying. Oh, PGD Grant Help Cure HD. Is that in the US, Jesse? Uh. Yeah. This is, replying, yes. it's is it covered in the UK now? Yes, we were just on a session about that. So um, in the UK, for anyone listening, we've just heard from some of the genetic counsellors. I think it's three rounds of IVF with PGD is covered across the UK, which I didn't realise. I thought it was different on different areas of the UK, but that's normal IVF. IVF with PGD is, is covered apparently for three uh, rounds. Um, we do have some questions. Oh, yeah. Um, so. so we've got uh, one. Oh, you can just answer them. Do you want me to read them out? <laughs> I got it. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, gene positive, middle of a career change, like any advice about how to keep positive and not be down. I, I don't want to pretend like I was never down. Like, it's hard. But, I, well, I'll tell you, just to, just to, if you're feeling down about it, just to prove that I was too, like I actually dropped out of grad school. I went into Michael Hayden's office and I told him like, I only have so much time. Like, this is crazy. PhDs take forever and I'm going to quit. I'm going to go out to move to an Island and like raise sheep. And he was like, okay, you can move out to the Island and buy a sheep, but like, don't drop out of grad school. And he let me like take a pretty significant amount of flex time to figure it out. Cause he's, you know, great. But um, so just to say that it's not that there wasn't downtimes. It's just that like, it's going to be hard no matter what. And it can be hard and you can like turn away or you can keep working, you know? And every time I've decided to keep working, it's like been a really good payoff. And some of that's luck. And some of that's just like, I think that's what happens when you do the hard thing. And um, so it doesn't, you don't have to be a scientist, but whatever you can do for the community, I think is, is really good. And um, you know, yes, you're going to get down, but like you might as well get down and then shake it off and then be further along the road to, to further the cause. Um, about being afraid to build my scientific life around HD. Um, I, I have to say, again, I was lucky, like I was young. I, when I found out about my mom, you know, I was already, I hadn't even been back to college yet. I didn't have my undergrad. So I had a, I had a chance to do that. Um, were it to happen now, were I already a scientist, it would be a lot trickier because I'd already have like labs and collaborations and projects and stuff. So I just, it's, it, it, it kind of got lucky for me. And um, sometimes people ask, like, also, like, well, isn't it hard to have it in your whole life? And like, from my point of view, like, it's in my life anyway. And like, I would either be dealing with it in my life, or I'd be pretending to, you know, ignore it, like a lot of people do. And I haven't seen that lead to a lot of great outcomes. Um, you know, people are trying to avoid it. So, um, 
about advice or situations about one sibling being born prior to PGD. So this is a really tricky issue, you know, um, like, oh, and I got to stop in just a second. Um, I don't have an easy answer to this. The, the, the uneven application of IVF in the family or PGD in the family is really, really hard. Um, you know, my family struggles with it. There's, there's people that are affected that um, have kids, um, you know, so it's, it's challenging, uh, Jordan, and I don't have any magic words of advice. I think, you know, communicating as clearly as you can is good, but um, yeah, it's, it's tough stuff. Yeah, I think we can go ahead and ask, answer the last one and then we'll, we'll, um, Oh, if do you ever get professional? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I think the HD people that I know, so the question is about like professional help, like psychological help, I think. And I think that the HD people that I know who are best able to deal with it have some kind of support network, whether that's like a professional help, um, you know, like therapy um, or a social network that's really supportive and, and gets HD. And I think, um, you know, I don't speak so much about what I've done, but I would say that like for me, the most, um, the most supportive thing has been like being in a really good social network. Like some of my best friends are HD scientists now and it's, that helps me a lot in a way that isn't accessible to everyone. But um, I think everyone should either, yeah, if you can find the help in your social network, that's great. If, 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 if it helps to have professional help also amazing and um, HD is hard and like any help anyone can get, uh, I am a hundred percent in favor of. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, thank you so much, Jeff, um, for your time again and, and for your wonderful talk. And um, we're nearly at the end of day one. Uh, we just have the closing session with Matt, if you want to switch over to listen to Matt again for 10 minutes um, to close day one. And then we hope to see you all back here um, for day two tomorrow with all the research updates, which will be very exciting to hear about. Um, so thank you again, Jeff, and to everyone for attending. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye.